Good afternoon, everyone. That was such a power-packed uh, session, and we call it Rising Stars because you could, you know, see some of them IPOing in years or even months from now. Rapido, in fact, turned unicorn just last week. So great timing. But Podi, over to you. So uh, thanks, Chandra. Welcome, uh, Prashant. Oh, great uh, to be here, Podi. Chandra. <laughs> this Thank is you, like Prashant. Home, like a, it's every year now. Uh, this is my third year, probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is my first year. Thank you, thank you. But thank you've you. promised to come to Bangalore more often now, yeah, I, so I will, I we'll, will. we'll see you more often here. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you once again. Just wanted to uh, just start off with a with a question on the current state of the startup sector. So if you look at the you know last few months back, there was the talk of the funding winter and startups. You know, basically the valuation going down and and down rounds. But if you, the more recent past has been very positive. You've seen uh, three IPOs and two big IPOs. I'm talking about Ola Electric and First Cry and also Unicommerce. And I think some investors would be very happy at the kind of exit they're making. So are the, has the vibes, to use a sort of modern term, has that returned to the, to the startup sector? Uh, is it now seeing a turnaround? You have now a critical mass of listed companies. Uh, there were obviously, you know, the others like Zomato, which were listed before Nike. So, uh, Prashant, you want to go first on this? Yeah, Bodhi. Um, so, I think uh, um, the first round of uh, IPOs were not exactly the way we wanted them to play out. And uh, the good news is that I think very quickly the startup sector and the investors, founders, everybody learned what to expect, mm. what, what public market investors expect, what do you promise and not promise, right? And how do you then consistently deliver on that? And I think uh, Zamato was one of the first ones to actually demonstrate that playbook, that if you really uh, show growth and um, you know deliver on profits better or more than what you promise, I think the market rewards you significantly. So I think uh, that has given a lot of confidence and the overall uh, economy uh, shift to where the money flow into the public markets is unlike what we have ever seen. You know, so there is actually a lack of good assets. My definition of a good asset is companies with 1,000 crores of real revenue and profitable. You'll be surprised if, if, I mean, we all talk about, I mean, consumption and consumer companies. There are less than 30 to 40 companies which are listed, which are 1,000 crore plus and profitable. So there is a fundamental mismatch between the appetite in the public markets and uh, uh, the assets that are available to go public. So I think uh, this is a good problem to have. So the faster the ecosystem gets these companies into this IPOable state or IPO thing, I think uh, we, we have one of those uh, reap times or spring times, like you said, Bodhi. I think just taking from where Prashant, I think Prashant has addressed the public markets to your point, and obviously that catalyzes the entire chain. So let's start with the VC side, because I think I'm, I'm the new guy in the VC world. And what I find, Prashant, is that there is no funding mentor, frankly. We thought Soren came at a great time, irrelevant. Family offices today who are making money in the public markets are putting serious money into the private markets, either on their own or through AIFs. That money is there. Uh, you're finding, obviously, government also catalyzing through SIDB and SRI. So all of those things are helping. And I think in seed and series A, there's never been a winter. In yeah. fact, to Prashant's point, it is the <coughs> quality of founders, which is still very good. But having economically viable business models is what is creating a so-called winter on the funding side. I don't think it's a funding winter. It's a winter of finding good quality companies. He's referring to companies who are getting ready to go public. I'm referring to companies that we can invest in. Uh, there's no winter in seed and series A. B, C, D looks like, but again, there's enough capital available. You just got to start seeing the initial uh, success of the product market fit, some paths to profitability, and good quality founders who have a proper modicum of governance. I, I, I think the funding winter is a complete misnomer. Actually, a supply of good assets, early stage and late stage, is the real thing. 
That's and then, an, then there is many questions. Why? It's a very Why? strong and, statement and, and, to make yeah, because we've been is. using funding winter, yeah. funding winter in the headline for the last two years. But you're saying there's no funding winter. No, I such. think there is a reset in what investors now set uh, have a bar. Hmm. For what's an investable company at a Series A, for no, example. But they're more discerning, that's all. Yeah. But that doesn't they're mean the wallets discerning. are empty. Yeah. Sanjay, if I can ask you, just to turn this question a slightly different way, you've obviously had a long stint as a, as a renowned investor, as the head of KKR uh, for many years. Obviously, the companies were very different. Uh, and now you've now shifted to a kind of venture capital, early stage investing. So what do startups have to do, using the term perhaps loosely, to keep investors happy? <laughs> if you ask me that question, you know, we were taught in private equity, look for the exit before you enter. <laughs> so I, I can't do that, but point is I do ask these questions. I'm not actively involved in this, but I think we've got to have a clear path. And whether, you know, we start at Series A, got to see visibility of C and D, and you've got to get taken out. You don't have to be wedded to these companies. We were taught that. In private equity, it's mechanical. End of year five, you start the process. If not, buddy up with the entrepreneur and decide on a strategic sale. So I think that's a huge thing. And I think it's going to benefit early stage founders because everybody is not going to find the, the utopian world of IPO. Everybody doesn't and cannot become a unicorn. I don't know why they all want to become unicorns. Yeah, if you make half a billion and the guy can get a good exit by selling to a strategic, why not? So I think, and again, we're not encouraging them to exit. We're not saying that. But point is that, uh, you know, you've got to not be wedded to your company. So that's one big learning for me in, in, in private equity. And I think founders work so hard. They've given up careers. They build businesses. They deserve, if they make 100 million, that's not bad, yeah? Prashant? Yeah, Bodhi, we're yeah. looking at companies. No, I think this is an important one. What are investors looking for? And where have we figured out and where we have not figured out, right, as an ecosystem? I think we still... Uh, yet to understand that this is one of the toughest ecosystems to generate a profit in. Yeah. Right? I think that what the traditional businesses in India always got well is that you have to figure out how to make my first yeah. rupee in profit. Right? And I think the, the, uh, the entrepreneurs have started to see that because they know, okay, later I'll have to go to uh, these public markets and get that. But, but that trickle down, I think, into their mindset that it's not about technology, it's not about uh, how good your product is. Have you a business model which has figured out how to make profits, right? I think that orientation with entrepreneurs in the early stages, I think there is still a little bit of a, a reset mismatch. That, uh, I think the only thing I want to add is that I think what investors are looking for, and I, Prashant's been in this business much, much longer than all of us, there has to be a meeting of the eye. I know it's very early to say that with the founders. Why are you choosing me as your investor? Not why I'm choosing you. They have a choice of investors, right? And why are they choosing me as an investor or my firm? What is expected of us? And of course, those things will change. And have enough openness that you can... As they say, you know, the corner office is always lonely. And this poor guy is a corner office in a small company struggling to make money. He's going to have a lot of issues. Can he open up with you without you banging his head or, or you know, being condescending? These are very important qualities. And I think as investors, it's our responsibility. But so it is theirs to look us in the eye and say, I hope I get this from you in our journey for the next five, seven years. Right. Um, Prashant, two-part question for you. Um, one company that's, you know, outperformed beyond what people expected in the new age economy vintage is Zomato. Um, from the time they listed, you know, people were calling it a tomato stock and, you know, to kind of prove every naysayer wrong, the way they've executed on Blinkit. Does that, you know, uh, make you somewhat nervous? Because Swiggy is, you know, in your portfolio, they have filed confidentially for IPO. The benchmark is now so high, and they will be benchmarked against Somato. They will be ben benchmarked against Blinkit. You know, how do you see this panning out in the public markets? So far, this rivalry was in the private markets. But how, would, how do you see this panning out on Dalal Street? See, I think public investors are smart. 
they look at every company for what it's capable of and what it's worth, right? So it's not that, uh, and also uh, investors want uh, diversification, right? So everybody does not want to just bet on one, one, one asset or one company in a particular space. So I think, uh, you know, I, I really believe that investors will be discerning and will see, uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, different parts of the country, different platforms dominate. Mm. So it's not a uniform one platform that has a dominant market share in every part of the country. And that's, and we have seen those, those uh, leaderships in different parts of, don't change so easily. So it's, uh, I think uh, they, there are reasons why, uh, you know, there will be value in different platforms. And I think investors are smart enough uh, and will, uh, will value that. Right. Question to both of you. There's a lot of criticism that while Bangalore gets more of the noise, uh, the surround sound, it's the Delhi companies that end up doing most of the IPOs. Why do you think that is? Why are they ahead of us when it comes to tech? You guys are stuck in traffic half the day. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I've just come after two years. Seriously. No, I've, I, I've come back after two years. I've been spending like... <laughs> no, no I, I really believe that... Uh, Prashant, this, you no, have to no, make a strong I, case. No, You're no. the ambassador, unofficial ambassador of the city. No, I, I, I think it's about finally the good companies will come from Bangalore. Uh, <laughs> right? So the... Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, the, I think the, the companies that are sustainable and will, will create great, um, you know, long-term... Uh, IPO stories, I think, will happen from Bangalore. I think, uh, you know, Delhi has an initial a good set of companies that have gone IPO, and, and that's great. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I, I know there's a list of companies that are uh, in process from Bangalore, and all, most of them would IPO. In six months, I think we'll have a different story. But I could, but I could make a guess, I'm just to be contrarian. I think the, I don't know, the Delhi companies or Bombay, but I think Bangalore market has become very incestuous, okay? Bangalore guys love Bangalore guys. Bangalore is the place. That's the only ecosystem. All the VCs are here. My guys forced me to open an office here. Yeah, you come to Bombay and see the struggles you have to do in Bombay and real businesses get built despite the struggles of where you live and how you travel. That's number see, one. Whatever what money. In Delhi. Yeah, yeah. Let, <laughs> let, let, let me finish Bombay. See, Bombay, uh, I think, uh, it, how many of you have heard of uh, where Zepto moved last week? Prashant, we had Zepto today. <laughs> because I think he wants a comfortable life and he wants good weather, okay? You want to have tough weather, you've got to come to Delhi, Bombay, you've got to slog it out. And I'm not joking, I, I really think some of the Bangalore guys should move to Bombay and Delhi and slog it out. You learn how to build real businesses against all the headwinds. This okay. is a very supportive society. Quick show of hands, how many of you will move to Bombay or Delhi to build a business? You're already based in Noida. No, they are, I think these are the guys who are actually based there. Yeah. No, but ask the, ask the, how many of you guys from Delhi and Bombay and uh, will, will move to Bangalore? Everybody. Yeah, so that's it. No, but I think that, isn't diversity good? No, it's good. Actually, it's, yeah, I, I think in India needs like multiple clusters and multiple Absolutely. centers. So I think it's great that we have three good clusters. I just wanted to, to shift... Um, you know, to lower the temperature, although I don't know whether it, it is actually going to lower the temperature, but anyway. And I just wanted to, you talked about learnings of, of startup companies and, uh, uh, you know, from interacting with the public market. So, there, um, there have been two recent <coughs> cases where two, where startup companies have faced, you know, regulatory headwinds. One was, uh, uh, you know, a comp I'm referring to Paytm, which could have perhaps become the Alipay of India. Um, it faced a major regulatory action. There is also uh, another company in, it, in the tech sector, which was India's most uh, valuable startup at one time. By Jews. By. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I was I was going goal goal to tr uh, avoid trouble, avoid saying that. As a troublemaker. Yeah. So by Jews, <laughs> which uh, has had its uh, let's say its share of issues. So, um, what are the learnings? What are the big picture? What are the takeaways? What should startups learn? I'm happy to go. Look, uh, Prashant, this is, thank God. Yeah. Sanjay, go I think he's, being, he's being very diplomatic. The first question is given to me first. <laughs> no, I think the thing is, uh, both the models I, I know pretty well. I think if you think of it, they are both great business models. Okay, So they were not misplaced in that. I think it's to just cut to the chase 
uh, in that growth journey, uh, I think they've had a, a bit of hubris that comes into the, into the founder. I know it all. I know what I'm doing. Don't challenge me. Don't question me. So I think that's one. And you sort of stop listening. You hear, but you don't listen to what people are telling you. I think that's one. And the second one is, I think the ecosystem around them doesn't want to give them bad news, doesn't want to question them. So these are two very major things, and that's why I made the comment earlier. As investors, we got to make sure that we are able to be open up with our uh, founders and vice versa. So I, I think that's been a huge issue, and one or two of them have had repeated feedback and have yet turned a blind, a blind eye to it. I'm not commenting on governance and other issues, just the psychological issues of what goes on in the mind as you become you know, bigger and more successful. I think these are two very tricky qualities that you have to look out for. So I think, uh, Sanjay, I, I would just add a couple things, right? One is uh, you need to be uh, clear before you IPO. Is your central business model uh, at that level of maturity and product fit that you can clearly see a path to scaling that? rather than discovering new models as you go along. You can't go public with that kind of a mindset. I mean, I'm just being blunt here on some things, right? The second thing is you've you got to be careful on acquisitions, hmm. what acquisitions you make. And are, are those acquisitions leading to a coherence in your business model or is it distracting you in your business model? I think that's the second big thing. I think the third uh, big lesson in my mind is uh, don't market ahead of your product, right? I think all these three are important lessons. But even on m and I mean, I'm sure someone advised them not to do it, but did they listen to them? I think that's the question. They right. don't want to I mean, listen. At some point, they, they would have got enough No advice. point advising if the founder doesn't listen. No, but, you know, there again, I'll, I'll be very honest. Uh, you know, we all sit on boards when new rounds are happening, new valuations are happening. Nobody questions anything in these days. <laughs> right, time's up, but Bodhi has one short question. No, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, if you take China, which has also an enormous, much bigger than India startup technology ecosystem, it is heavily state-directed. Clearly, the Chinese government wants investments to go not to companies, consumer-focused companies, but to companies that are doing what they consider advanced, you know, quantum computing, AI, etc. Uh, whereas in India, that's clearly not the case, right? You have a lot of emphasis on companies delivering in 10 minutes or 8 minutes or whatever it is, those kind of things. Uh, what, what are your views? It's, uh, it's changing, Bodhi. It's changing in two dimensions. One is, I think, there is a real focus uh, and shift in entrepreneurs moving into manufacturing. When I say manufacturing, it's not assembling, you know, with the 10,000 people kind of a facility. It's about precision manufacturing. See, we are one of the few countries that has engineering and science and will be able to build manufacturing capabilities which leapfrog. So very strongly believe in that. We are actually seeing entrepreneurs being able to do that. Very early days, uh, and I'm not talking space tech, I'm not talking anything really fancy, I'm just talking about precision manufacturing in where their supply chains are diversifying, right? Second is, I think, uh, the broader consumption story in India, I think, will always lead. And opportunities for investors will be in consumption. So I think that's where you will see a lot of the money. Right. I, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, I, I've got to say something on this. I, I think you should not compare to China. A, I think we are way behind, okay? They are 20 times bigger cap per capita GDP than us. Their AIF equivalent is a trillion dollars. Just to understand, local money with local managers in Chinese come trillion dollars, okay? I don't know how many we have, 800 AIFs, and maybe 20 of them are more than $100 million. So we have a long way to go. It's not about state and local funding. In the evolution cycle, we have a longer way to go to tap local savings, which I know we, we really believe we should increase through the AIF thing. And on the tech curve, I think between the talent, the availability of capital, the kind of investors, the patients, we have a long distance to go. I think we should just keep the China comparison away. Okay, I was there a month ago and I just saw driverless cars, parks on the side, pavement opens, robot comes out, takes the battery, puts it back in three minutes, and the car keeps moving. I mean, 
you know, we've got potholes here to worry about, but you know, just think of, so we shouldn't compare. I think we've got enough things to do. We've got to get the local savings, good managers, good local funds. We'll attract more local capital. The locals understand local founders better. We've got a long way to go in that. Right. We're out of time. Rapid fire. What's your anti-portfolio? Anti-portfolio. <clears throat> um, Zomato. No, 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 no. Why? why? <laughs> Come on. No, okay. I'll say maybe I'll, uh, you know, miss the, miss the first wave of insurance uh, startup through, through Policy Bazaar. But maybe FinTech because you'll have a conflict with cover firms. No, no, but, but then we, uh, we caught up with ACO. Ah, okay. Uh, Which was have... also the cover Fox founder. Yes, but uh, we missed one, but we got one. Sanjay. Uh, we don't have an anti portfolio, but I hope we have one. Okay. We, we, we are sort of too young right now, so. Great. On that note, Sanjay and Prakash, thank, uh, Prashant, thank, thank you, you so much for such a candid discussion. Thank you. Thank you.